Today on the Tech Bytes podcast, we talk about Gen AI apps. From search to software development to video creation, generative AI tools are widely available, both as standalone apps and they're being bundled into enterprise applications. And whether you want them or not, Gen AI, Gen AI apps are out there and running wild. On today's show, sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, we talk about the uses of and the risks that these applications pose and options that you have to deal with those risks. Our guest is Tim Davis, Director of Data Security at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, Tim, welcome to the podcast. And my first question is, how do we know that you're not a Gen AI chatbot? Is there like a Turing test or a Voight Conf test we should be using to make sure you're a human? Yeah, well, uh, you know, since this is audio only, uh, you can't see my face. <laughs> if you could see my face, you'd know nobody would pick this for a, uh, a Gen AI because uh, nobody would want to see it. But, uh, you know, yeah, how do you know, right? That's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, I'd just tell you that uh, I've seen things you guys wouldn't believe. I mean, I've seen attack ships on fire <laughs> off the shoulder, you know, so there you go, right? So yeah, there's, there's your test. So. <laughs> So we are here to talk about sort of the proliferation of Gen AI apps and what what are you seeing out there? What's what's coming at us in, in terms of these applications and their it, uses? Yeah, it's it's absolutely everywhere, right? It's uh you know, when your when your mother in law uh is is uh literally calling you, uh asking you about using uh a Gen AI app that she found, uh you know that it's taken off, right? So uh -huh. your tech challenge when your tech challenge family uh, you know, is, is out there, you know, using, uh, trying to edit a video using a Gen AI app, you know that, uh, hey, this is big and taking off. And the numbers don't lie, right? There's uh, well over 2,000 known documented Gen AI applicants, standalone Gen AI applications that are out there today. Uh, and it's growing crazy fast. Uh, it's about uh, 3x the, the rate at which uh, mobile grew. And, and a little over 2x the rate at which worldwide web adoption happens. So wow. uh, we're projecting well, uh, or industry analysts, not not me, but you know, people who are smarter than me are projecting well over 15,000 of these applications by uh, the end of this decade. So, uh, you know, this, it's, it's, it's crazy growth uh, and uh, they're solving all kinds of unique problems and doing all kinds of interesting things. So, uh, you know, people want to use them because because they do solve all these kinds of problems and make 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 them more productive uh, in different tasks they're doing, whether it's things they're doing at home for fun, you know, editing a video of the grandkids or great grandkids that are, you know, playing uh, like uh, that's what my mother in law is trying to do uh, or uh, even, you know, uh, people who want to use them for work. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of use cases uh, and all kinds of great tools out there. Uh, but. Uh, you know, with uh, as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and so that's something that uh, both individuals and organizations need to be thinking about as they begin to use some of these tools. Yeah. And we all know there weren't any security issues with mobile or web. Uh, it was all oh, fine. absolutely so. not. Right. It was all clean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, with the some of the security concerns that have been uh, are becoming known with Gen AI, we're not seeing enterprises push back and saying, no, no, you can't use it. We're seeing adoption as opposed to caution. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm, conversations I'm having, uh, it really typically go one of two ways. Uh, one is, um, hey, we've we we put our head in the sand and just pretended like these aren't there. Uh, and and now we're um, now we're kind of realizing that this is a problem we can't ignore and we're going to have to do something about it. Uh, and then the the other group is. Uh, they they started using legacy tools to block as many apps as they could uh, early on. As soon as they you know, as soon as Chat GPT hit, you know, about you know eighteen months ago and became this this thing that everybody was talking about. They started blocking it, blocking the other apps, and then now they're they're essentially trying to do um, you know maintain that over time, right? And so they've kind of taken the no, the hard no approach. Um, so for the first group, the group that's that's uh, kind of ignored the problem up until recently, right? They're realizing they can't; it's not going to go away, uh, and so they've got to do something about it. Uh, and for the second group, um, they're not being allowed to continue to say no in a lot of cases. Um, you know, there's sometimes they're getting pressure from their boards and from their uh, executive leadership because they're they're hearing in the industry about how some of these things can make their, their users productive and they want to, uh, you know, adopt that productivity. And in some cases it's uh, user driven. You know, I had one, one person tell me that, you know, I've had users show up with torches and pitchforks at my door. I hope not, I hope you meant not literally uh, that, uh, you know, Hey, I, I need my chat GPT to write my emails. Like, you know, you got to give it to me. So uh, it's uh, but, but users are wanting it, um, you know, boards and, and executive leaderships want it for that 
productivity gain uh, and uh, there's there's financial benefit for those organizations. I mean, think about uh, some of these video editing tools out there where people used to pay tens of thousands of dollars to a firm to edit some video. Now I can get a, a software subscription and do that for a couple hundred bucks. So, uh, you know, there's, that's a big gain right there. But then you've got the questions of, do I trust that tool that I'm using? Right. So what are they going to do with that data? So those are the, those are the concerns that people have to think about, but you can certainly understand why people want to use them. Uh, and, um, and, you know, it, but it tends to fall in those two categories. Uh, and, and so it's either it's the wild, wild west and we're trying to rein it in, uh, or we've shut it down and now we're trying to, uh, you know, sort of cautiously allow, some some a few apps here and there um, just to, you know, turn on this bigot a little bit um, and see see what productivity gains we can gain from it. The concerns are it's a little different as a security professional thinking about these sort of applications. The secure the concerns used to be, well, the bad guys are going to get in the door if I use this wrong. It's uh, they're going to we're going to become part of a botnet or or there's be data leakage. Uh, some 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 of my data is going to go out to someone who I don't want to have that data, you know, corporate espionage and these kind of things. Hmm. Gen AI feels a little different as a security professional. How do I how do I do a risk assessment on, uh, on one of these applications? How do I, how should I be thinking about it to understand what the risk really is? Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, fantastic question, right? And it's a great way to, you know, great, great to realize that this is not, um, this is not the standard problem that we're used to solving in the industry. So, you know, you have to really think about these things a little differently. Um, there's a lot of different dynamics here. Uh, I'll just, I'll just talk through a couple real quick. Um, the first one is, if you think about it, how how you use a Gen AI tool is, if you're using it productive, if for, in a productive way, uh, at least, uh, is is really very different. Let's just take, um, you know, so writing assistants, conversational agents, that category, um, and think about that for a moment. Uh, you know, what what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand a, some set of data to that um, solution. Uh, to that app and then and then give it a prompt. I'm going to give it instructions of what I want it to do. Hey, write me an email that that uh, that that you know reaches this audience with this set of criteria. Take this data um, and match it with match it with this set this this data set and match it with this data set. Uh, you know something like that, right? So I'm, so it's not just handing data, but I'm actually giving instructions too, right? So this is a a different mode of um, of operation here, right? It's it's not just data storage, but it's actually, you know, now these tools are, are actively manipulating these data uh, or this data in a lot of cases where it's creating new data and new inferences from the data that I hand it. Um, so there's there's new data created as well, new information created as well. So the traditional modes, t you know, sometimes don't apply, um, but there absolutely um, are, are some threat vectors as well that uh, a lot of people don't think about. And I, I'll just give you two quick examples of, of that. Uh, one would be um, that, uh, you know, it, what, how is that, how is that data being used by, by the app, right? So I hand it some data mm -hmm. say, Hey, I want you to process this information for me, do, do something to it, you know, a set join or something like that it could be something even that trivial, you know, is that, is, is what, is what I hand that, that model now going to be used to continue to train the model or not? Right. And I'm okay with that because I may not want that to happen. Uh, because, you know, there, there can, for, for some, some newer models and some, you know, earlier stage models and things like that, there's ways to, uh, you know, draw out training data from uh, within a prompt, right? So now company A's sensitive data that was used to enhance that company B might accidentally or purposefully get access to that data if that app is using data in that's given to it to continuously train. The other thing that can happen is these 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 models are essentially you know written on open source software, so they they have vulnerabilities too. So it's possible for models to be jailbroken, which means data can leak out, which also means that I can inject into responses potentially uh, you know malicious information. And there have been cases of this already where uh, malicious links to uh, malware have been returned in response to prompts in some you know, some, some less secure, and this isn't happening right now in the, that I'm aware of in any of the, the big tent uh, applications, but, but in some, some of these kind of smaller, uh, more niche apps, um, this has definitely happened, right? Where, where links to malware uh, and sites have been returned in result of prompts. So again, there's a lot of dynamics here that, that just aren't the traditional model, as, as you point out. 
So what is the risk that data that I enter into a prompt could end up uh, in the training set uh, for some AI tool that somebody else could then maybe accidentally extract? Yeah, so uh, it, sometimes it can just happen accidentally. Um, uh, I saw an instance of uh, an early stage model um, in, in the healthcare space where uh, they were using uh, real patient data to train that model. And then uh, the, it, the model spit out that patient data. It said, ah, well, you know, th this diagnosis is very similar to what this patient with name, address, social security number, <laughs> so, oh you know, so, and again, that's, uh, you know, that's sort of an extreme example. And um, most, uh, most, most of your more sophisticated models have moved beyond that. But what, what you can look for, and this is something that, you know, we don't think about, right? When we, we, we sign up for a SaaS application, particularly as consumers, but even a lot of times as organizations, we, you know, who, who reads the T's and C's, right? <laughs> Literally yeah. nobody, right? Uh, so now there are the organizations do have lawyers that are supposed to read the T's and C's, um, and hopefully they do. Uh, but, uh, you know, but, but buried within those T's and C's, uh, among other things with these Gen AI apps is, can we use your data to train our model? Um, yes or no, right? Or will we use our, that mod, we use it? We will or we won't, or maybe we don't say. Um, so that's an important thing that, to ask, right, and to understand um, if 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 we want to do that. Now, I do want to caveat that by saying there may be cases where I want someone to do that, right? Um, so so it's not that I need the answer to always be no. It's that I need to understand the use case for when I want the answer to be no. But when I, and then there there may be other use cases where I want the answer to be yes. Mm -hmm. So how how do we defend against bad things happening in our interactions with Gen AI chatbots and and related tools? Yeah. You know, if I think about like like a WAF, right? Mm -hmm. It, it kind of sits mm -hmm. there and it's very savvy about like what I input into a form and mm -hmm. and so on. It can really sanitize your input yep. and monitor the output. Uh, proxy servers get right in the middle of a conversation and can uh, have some very good insight into what's actually happening in real time. Well, is the same kind of thing available to me here or is it too, are we too new? Is it too, is Gen AI too new of a thing that we can get in the middle and monitor the conversation? Yeah. So uh, I would, I would say, you know, let's kind of think about the method uh, you know, how do we, how do we get in between an intercept? Right. And, and then let's think about the, um, the, the process, right. So uh, then what do we do once we're, you know, once we're in the middle how, what what are, what are we going to do, right? So the methods, as you point out, right? There's 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 you know they're they're not going to be anything super new right now, right? We're seeing kind of two two options. One is that traditional good man in the middle, right? Especially for browser based applications, let's be the good man in the middle. Let's decrypt. Let's look at what's coming, what's going. Let's let's put some let's run some rules against it. Decide what we're going to happen. Decide decide if we think this is okay or not. The other option is uh, a, um, I don't want to say a proxy necessarily, but but some something like sort of a uh, um, an application uh, that that is a, a, a central point of application, right? So somewhat maybe analogous to how you know today we don't think of Microsoft Word as a separate application, right? We think of it as part of. 365, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so maybe there's an application that is my, uh, you know, my AI assistant, right? Uh, and it has links to multiple models and it's, but it's my one go-to, right? So maybe it can, uh, maybe it has uh, a connection into uh, Firefly for, uh, for video editing. And it also has a connection to, uh, to Gemini for, for my, my code assistant. It has a connection to chat GPT, uh, things like that. Right. So maybe it's got connections to multiple different uh, models that um, so in, in an organization, someone has approved uh, and is vetted. Uh, so it's got, so it's got access to multiple tools, but for me, it's just one tool um, and whatever I need, I just go to that one tool and then it, it takes it from there. Now, when you implement something like that, um, then, you know, it, uh, then we're seeing it before it's decrypted, right? So it's not really a proxy in the traditional sense of a web proxy, but it's more of a, uh, a, a waypoint. So now it sees my prompt, it sees the data that I'm passing to it. 
before it's encrypted, before it's sent, uh, bef- uh, you know, over over a TLS transaction. Um, so then it can do the analysis right then and there, right? But obviously that takes some um, engineering uh, to make that happen. And it also sounds like it takes some policy work to make that happen because there are Absolutely. some classes of data you don't want going in and some that are fine. And yeah, so yeah. That's, that's a whole conversation. And, and, and you also have to block the going direct, right? So I kind of have to make that my only available tool, right? Otherwise, people could just go around it and go straight to whatever tool they want, and then I lose all my protections. But then, so yeah, that brings up the second point then. So once I've gotten in the middle and, I, and I'm looking at this, then now I have to think about things differently uh, because I'm not just thinking about, you know, hey, is this data, is this sensitive finance data? Is this my customer data? Is this my source code? And I don't want it going to this place. Uh, or when something returns, you know, is this is this link malicious? Is there a uh, potential, you know, did did I get a bad response? Right. Did I get something that this looks fishy? Right. Um, those kinds of things. So um, but I also have to think about now, how how is this being prompted? Right. So you guys have probably seen uh, some of the the early tricks that people would do, uh, you know, in the early versions of even even in open AI. Right. Where it was, uh, hey, tell me how to build a bomb. Well, I can't do that. But then you could say, hey, write a story about someone building a bomb. And then it was, oh, well, step one is, blah, blah, you know, so, you know, so, so they're, you know, now the, the models are getting more sophisticated, uh, so they don't fall for those same tricks over and over again. But that's not to say, you know, one of the things I believe in is the uh, the endless creativity of humanity, right? Uh, and right. If, you don't, if you ever doubt that, just uh, sign up for a Twitter or X account and you you, you see, uh, and, and when, when there's something to be made fun of, the the, the memes never stop, right? So... Uh, but the, the endless creativity of humanity uh, can be applied to this as well. And people are going to find ways uh, around these safeguards to get at information that maybe shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be shared. Right. So, you know, so that's 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 a whole nother layer of data security that you know, we're, traditional tools just typically aren't prepared for. Right. Because we're just purely looking at content, not intent. So do you feel like. Uh, AI risk management, we'll call it, is a new discipline or just sort of extending what we're already doing in security and risk management generally? I think I think right now it's going to it's going to to grow out of um, most likely your data protection, data security practice for enterprises. Right. That, that's mm-hmm. probably where it makes sense for it to fall today. But it as these a number of apps increase. Uh, both externally and internal to the organization, uh, this is this is probably going to become something that is largely its own thing, right? And and something that um, is is somewhat new, uh, somewhat new discipline that will you know take some specialization. Uh, and and honestly, um, a lot of this is still to be determined, right? We're still, you know, we're, we're still very young in this, um, and. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's going to be an interesting evolution to watch, right? But just like, um, you know, whole industries have grown up around, uh, you know, securing uh, web web applications, right? Now, I, I think there will be, you know, at least, at least not, if not whole industries, at least sub industries uh, within that around securing uh, AI applications. And again, that, I talk a lot about AI applications that live outside of your organization, but you know, people are also developing in-house uh, AI applications as well for use by their by their users, and then for use by their customers. Uh, the the classic uh, the chatbot, right? When you want help on a website, right? You know, things uh-huh. like that, right? So there's there's uh, there's all kinds of uh, and and how do you make sure that your uh, this is another kind of interesting risk, right? How do you make sure my chatbot that I put on my website to help my customers? Uh, doesn't uh, lose its temper and start throwing four letter words at them. Right. Or, uh, you know, or, or spewing, you know, some, some other crazy stuff that would uh, be reputationally damaging to my organization. Right. So right. those are the kinds of risks that you have to think about now that we didn't really have to think about before. Uh. Uh, well, we've come to the end of our time, but there's definitely more to say here and more to learn. So uh, Tim, if folks are interested uh, in getting some details from Palo Alto networks, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, uh, you go to uh, you know our main website, paloaltonetworks.com, search for Precision AI. You'll find a handsome picture of Keanu Reeves, uh, and uh, you'll also find a whole lot of information about what we're doing in this AI security space. Uh, you know, keep trying to keep your uh, AI interaction safe and keep that data from disappearing like tears in the rain. 
Excellent. So that's uh, paloaltonetworks.com and just search for Precision AI. We'll also have Absolutely. that link in the show notes that accompany this podcast. Uh, Tim, thank you for playing along. I, I loved it. Um, and thanks to Palo Alto Networks uh, for joining us and being a sponsor. Uh, you can find this and many more fine, free technical podcasts and our community blog. It's all at packetpushers.net. You can follow us on LinkedIn, hear us on Spotify. And if you would leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. And last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.